Okay, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Sammy Zuhur Dean. I am a solutions architect on the Google Cloud team. Uh, just a quick show of hands. Who here, uh, this talk is, is mainly geared towards the decision makers, CIOs, leaders, uh, um, IT execs. Uh, who here is, uh, is, in, is, is here because they're in that capacity? Okay, great. Who here is, uh, who, who's here because the ML session was full? Okay, that's why I'm here. Uh, all right, so uh, now that we know each other so well, you know about me, I know about you, uh, I'd like to admit something here right at the outset, um, which, is, which is fine, you know, once you know a group of people. So I'd like to admit that about 10 years ago, uh, I worked for a startup. Um, that's not what I'm here to admit. Um, who hasn't worked for a startup? That's a more relevant question nowadays. Who hasn't worked for a startup? Okay, cool, about five of you. So, um, but anyways, I had, I had a serious problem about 10 years ago working for a startup. Uh, uh, I used to rack and stack servers. So it was kind of, it, it went part and parcel uh, with the job uh, back then. It was satisfying. You'd look at servers, you'd stack them, you know, you rack and stack them, you turn around, uh, it's done. Uh, of course, when I rack and stack servers, um, they did not look at this good. Uh, but like what happens with every startup, uh, we got bought. Um, right, that's pretty much what happens at every startup. Uh, most of them, a couple of them don't get bought. But things calmed down and I had a, I had a chance to sort of reflect in, in a new organization. You know, things calm down in your startup, things are very chaotic, but things calm down. You kind of look at the patterns you've been engaging on uh, and kind of decide what's next. How do you optimize? How do you kind of clean things up? There's a lot of technical debt. Um, and the ideas of racking servers, I was like, you know, there has to be a, a better way and of course, uh, what, was, what was coming and prevalent on the scene at the time was you can get away from racking and stacking servers by interacting with an API. And I thought that was pretty cool stuff. Um, as much as I enjoyed racking and stacking servers and deploying things by hand, uh, nothing was quite as easy as issuing a command and then all of a sudden you have resources at your disposal. So, uh, uh, you know, things kind of wandered down for me as, uh, in terms of what I was doing uh, as an IT leader and I was like, you know what, I, uh, I think this thing, this cloud thing is pretty, pretty cool. I'm gonna go and uh, I saw a job description, a solution architect, what is this? Okay, you go talk to customers, that sounds great. Um, you can, you know, you tell them cloud is great. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. Uh, so, and I was like, you know, that's easy. I mean, it's like, it's like a total easy sale. Uh, so I thought, you know, that'd be great. I'll talk to people like myself and I'll spread the word. Um, and what I found, of course, was uh, that as soon as I started having conversations, uh, a, lot of, a lot of IT executives are like, not so fast. Uh, you don't know anything. So, and what I found is it turns out that IT leadership is just spread across a huge, uh, huge spectrum. Um, and they have really varied reactions to the idea of going to the cloud. Um, and, you know, it's, and generally time has sort of caused this to shift over. And you know, a few years ago, most of the conversations were about awareness and what's possible and stuff like that. And now it's, it's generally about strategy, execution, cost, uh, picking a cloud, picking a technology that you can use uh, to, uh, to move to the cloud. It's about cloud strategy. You know, everybody today has a cloud strategy, except for those who don't. Um, but they all say they have a cloud strategy. Uh, it's just some of them are in research and some of them are not. And so, uh, it's, it's, but it's not enough to simply say, hey, we're gonna move to the cloud. Um, that's necessary, but not sufficient. So, and that's, that's rightfully so. As you move towards a CIO organization, there's, there's sort of a, you know, they're dealing with a lot. You know, security breaches and CapEx and how to train folks. And so there's, it's a rightfully kind of cautious and concerned. Um, there's a lot at stake. Um, and this is, this is the way it's come together for me. This is my grouping. Uh, this is loosely sort of resembling the crossing the chasm from uh, Jeffrey Moore. But generally what I find is there's, there's sort of this, this huge break um, on this spectrum, which is folks that are uh, kind of at that end of it, uh, that, you know, they haven't touched cloud much, um, and it takes a lot to sort of get them off, uh, off that path. And then there's some that warm up to the idea, and they'll, they'll say, oh, I'll do dev and test. Why? Because that, you know, that's, that's kind of a throwaway. Um, or it's an easy one to sort of to look at. Uh, but the big moment is when you, when you do that first production app. I find that that's generally 
the first time that the light bulbs go off um, to where this is something that's real. And usually I find when folks kind of cross that chasm, things accelerate very, very fast. And you start talking about hybrid cloud, you know, we want to bridge environments together, we want to bridge networks together, we want cloud environment to look like the on-prem environment. Um, and, you know, uh, the evolution of that is folks sort of say, okay, we're going to exit. We're going to exit on-prem. We're going to have a three-year strategy, five-year strategy to be all inside the cloud. And there's so many of these success stories. Um, I call them success stories. Uh, I don't know if hardware vendors call them success stories. But I call them success stories. Uh, and then there's cloud native. Cloud native is sort of this term that means that, you know, you're looking at APIs and you're looking at technologies and saying, how do we actually build, rebuild our application and redesign them to take advantage of these platforms? Um, and so, for, for someone in my position, uh, it makes a lot of sense to, to try to interpret the signals that, that you hear from folks across that spectrum. And so today's talk is generally about, um, it's generally about cl cloud adoption, but it's specifically about Google Cloud. Um, and it's a, a collection of, of feedback that I've seen. It's a collection of direct feedback from customers and lessons learned. Some of the customers are actually here. Um, and so I tried to make the, the talk sort of divided in two parts. One of it is just observations I see about what makes cloud, uh, cloud endeavors very successful inside of uh, customer organizations. And the other is about what folks on top of Google Cloud have told me made a difference to their journey. Um, and so I try to interpret the signals I get because I'd like to figure out where folks are on that, on that spectrum. And this is a very telling signal that someone's on the very early part of the spectrum. Um, I myself used to say this. This is a very kind of safety setting. Uh, but essentially it's, it's uh, hey, nobody ever got fired for, and then you pick your favorite vendor. And it's sort of like a, it's a very safe place, but it tells me kind of where somebody is on the spectrum and what kind of discussions are going to be relevant to them. And I myself, like I said, have said this in the past, uh, maybe 10 years ago. But it it's, tells me that we need to challenge conventional wisdom. Uh, I apologize here, no one. OK. Sorry about that. Um, the irony is, uh, I know CIOs who used to say this, and um, by the time they sort of realized that this was, this was more prohibitive than it wasn't prohibitive, uh, it, was, it was sort of too late uh, for them or their organizations, and it, and it required drastic change to move out of, the, move out of it. OK. This is another signal. This is another signal, a different kind of CIO, a different kind of IT executive where they sort of get it, they sort of know, like they eventually, they can see that the end of this, of this horizon is to end up on the other side of it. Uh, and this is usually a great, indica a great indicator, a great signal that they're looking at their environment very differently. They're like, you know, the folks I have today or the skills that I have today um, aren't quite gonna align with that cloud journey. We need to sort of rethink this, we need to foster new skills. Um, and so it tells me that, you know, they see that that's the end of the destination, uh, but, they're not, they're not really sure kind of how to incubate that. What I find interesting about that is uh, the skills, like, okay, networking is still a skill. Folks that know networking are still required in a cloud environment. But the way they're going to do networking changes dramatically. And so that, what I advocate is if, the, if, if somebody knows networking, that's 100% applicable. If somebody knows application development, that's 100% applicable. But what we need to do is educate on the fact of, or train on the fact of how to use APIs, API-driven infrastructure. If folks haven't used code before, if folks haven't used automation tools, these are the things we need to bolster on. But fundamental concepts about how to secure an environment, how networking works, how application development works, how storage works, these things don't really change. Um, regardless of which side of the spectrum you're on, by and large, this is like the first thing that comes out. We don't want to lock in. Um, and it's, it's not really an objection about moving forward. Uh, it's, even, if, even, if you're, even if somebody's decided, you know, going cloud is, is completely the way to go, uh, lock-in is a huge fear. Uh, and, and the reality is there's two kinds of lock-in. This is sort of the way I've broken down this discu discussion. Uh, it's what makes sense to me, and I think it comes across well. Um, there's hard lock-in. Hard lock-in is the kind of lock-in where 
you're in an environment, you're in a contract, and there's, there's, there's pain or financial waste for, for you know, backtracking or, or uh, ceasing that use of that contract. And so you're pretty much locked in. You're like, you know what? We sort of signed this. We're committed for the next three years um, uh, to, use this, uh, to use this environment, use this technology. And so it has this negative connotation to it. Um, and reality is there's something else that I, that I think that we, we don't pay attention to. There's something called soft lock-in. Soft lock-in to me is much, much more relevant. Soft lock-in is all the decisions you make above, uh, above the hardware. So picking a database, picking an application stack, picking an application framework is, has a much longer tail uh, from an has a much longer tail from, from an environment perspective than the hard lock-in. Uh, and what I mean by that is you, know, you, don't, you don't tend to change your database on, on a dime. You don't tend to change your application stack on a dime. And so what you want to do is spend time uh, figuring out how, uh, how to make this soft lock-in choice uh, in a way that gives you the most flexibility. And this is what's going to sound uh, paradoxical, is how do you make a soft lock-in choice that uh, make sure that you're open to a lot of choices. And the way to do that is to pick open standards. Open standards, open APIs, open source. Uh, this is why Google spends a lot of time in this dimension around that. And it's going to seem paradoxical, but if you make the right soft lock-in choices, it really sort of gives you a lot of leverages, gives you a lot of leverage to avoid getting stuck in a hard lock-in situation. And we'll talk more about that in the future. And the best way to do this, the best way to pick a soft lock-in um, uh, option is to look at where the trajectory is of a certain technology. And open source frameworks that are being released, kind of figure out where are they going, do they align with the kind of development objectives we have. And if we choose those, does it give us the most flexibility to avoid being hard locked into an environment? So they're intertwined. Uh, but I often find that folks just get stuck on the hard locking and they just want a bunch of kind of uh, you know, parachutes to get out of an environment. Um, and that's, that's, that sometimes is a hindrance, because you're spending more time figuring out how to make sure you're not locked into an environment than figuring out how to make choices that allow you to build your stack. At the end of the day, we have to build software. So what I like to do instead is to step back and say, you know, what kind of organization are you? That's, that's far more relevant conversation. We get stuck down into making exact technical choices, and I feel like we dive into the weeds too fast. And I like to ask, sort of like, you know, are you, are you a product company, are you a service company, are you a data company? Um, and not focusing on what kind of business you are is missing the forest for the trees. Um, and the best, the best conversations are the ones that get down into sort of what kind of company are you, what do you want to do? Um, and then it becomes clear what is the purpose of your IT organization. Uh, when it becomes clear what the purpose of your IT organization is, uh, to me, I like to sort of like have this revelation moment. The commonality in all those situations is it's software. Your IT organization is basically helping enable software. And that software could be driving your business, that software could be the crux of your business, it could be the product of your business, it could be making what you produce as a company software better. There isn't anything in terms of an IT organization that isn't made better by better software that's produced faster. Not just faster software, that's just better software, but software that you can produce faster um, at a higher quality. Um, and that's why it's relevant to be here today. If, we're, if this was a manufacturing contra, you know, conference and you were a medical device manufacturer, you'd be talking about how to, you know, making your manufacturing process more efficient because that's critical to your business. But when, when you're at a technical conference like this and when you're figuring out what technologies to use, what cloud to use, obviously it's about those technologies in helping you make better software. Um, and so as it turns out, Google has a little bit of uh, uh, experience with software. This is our original mission. Um, and from the beginning, Google has been about you know, essentially harnessing the world's data, making it globally, uh, universally accessible uh, and meaningful. And to do that, you have to learn a lot about dealing with data at scale. Um, and we've done a lot of things to figure out how to deal with data at scale. And uh, slides keep going off sync, sorry. And that's resulted in two aspects. Uh, of Google's, sort of Google's forte. Google has 
technical leadership that we'll talk about and infrastructure leadership. And if we didn't develop sort of new mechanisms and techniques for dealing with data at scale, uh, they wouldn't have led to sort of the revelations and, and research and infrastructure that we have in order to power that. This is an incredible feat to be able to deal with uh, data at the volume where you can be sitting on your phone right here, as a great number of you are, and like surfing your mail, right? That's like, uh, that's something that we have had to break the mold of what was conventionally possible before. But when we say Google's a technical leader or an infrastructure leader, that's not meant to be an exclusionary term. Google, in fact, sort of puts out thousands of papers of research. This is an example of, you can go to this right now, I mean, if you want to do literally right now, you could go to this. And papers have come out on GFS, HDFS, MapReduce, and that is directly, essentially, the, the impetus behind Hadoop. Bigtable was the impetus behind, behind HBase, Dremel's the, you know, the, the inspiration between, behind uh, Apache Drill, Borg, and so on and so forth. And so from Google's perspective, yes, we essentially have had to solve all these problems. We put all these problems out. We put the solutions to these problems out on on the internet. So when I talked earlier about open standards and open interfaces, we've done a lot to make sure that as a community, you're enabled with the same, uh, same assets. And they've resulted in some of the projects that have affected how data is managed today. And I don't know kind of where the data community would be without things like Hadoop. A second token of that is open source. So when I talked about research, these are things that we put out in the form of papers. But open source, these are direct projects that were essentially grooming and curating and producing to the community. And technologies like Go and Angular and TensorFlow, these are technologies that are part of infrastructure stacks and software development stacks that you're using today, currently. And so when I, when I kind of talk about our research and I talk about our open source, this is an example of sort of what I kind of deem the technical leadership, is that Google is pushing the bounds to solve our mission, to, 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 you know, to bring that mission to reality. We're pushing the bound of what's possible with data at scale and we're simply sharing that with the world. We're putting that out there. But our technical leadership doesn't stand on its own. So it takes an enormous amount of, of, uh, of infrastructure in the form of data centers and compute and storage and network. It takes a tremendous amount of technical infrastructure to support essentially the open source or the, the published software that I've talked about. And so that becomes the other pillar of, of the Google dynamic. It's what we put out in terms of our, our thought leadership, what we put out in terms of our infrastructure leadership. And I sort of mention this as, as, an, as a, as a buildup to, uh, to the fact that Google makes sure, or kind of the way we work internally, we try to make sure that developers are enabled and empowered. We don't want developers to deal with very low level um, operations. We don't want developers to have to think about logging into servers. We just think about, we want developers to have as little friction as they can because we want them to make better software faster. And so we've, we've, we've figured out how to abstract hardware, like the idea of notion of servers and where you should store, where you should store data and where you should back up things and how networks should be structured. We've abstracted all that away so the developers can have a very fast clip of moving forward. And if they can have a faster clip, they can improve uh, software development times quality and make it faster. So why, why do I spend so much time here? This isn't meant to be a sales pitch, but I want you to understand sort of where Google's coming. Wayne Gretzky says, you know, skate to where the puck is going. Uh, that was echoed probably about 1,200 times this morning. Um, but it's, it's an important notion to think about, is that Google thinks about these problems because it's entirely relevant to its own mission, and it makes sure that the community, it's not an exclusionary thing, it makes sure that the community is able to take advantage of that. And it's entirely relevant to you being here for Google Cloud because if you put those two aspects together, our technical leadership and our infrastructure leadership, and you put those as inputs, the output of that is Google Cloud Platform. The very same things that I talked about in our research and our open source and what was talked about all morning uh, is what is put into Google Cloud. So not only is it something that you can go and download and figure out, you know, download the research papers and download the open source, but it's now sort of served up in a way that's very easily consumable. It's very curated. And that same technical infrastructure that, I th that the 27 billion number was about, that's, you know, that's created and crafted around the world, uh, that's also served up to you. What does, that what does Google Cloud Platform look right now? Um, this is kind of the statutory uh, 
slide of our services. So this, this list keeps getting bigger. Uh, there was items announced this morning, and if you compare it to a year ago, two years ago, this is starting to get very, very fleshed out. It's not gonna fit on one slide by next year. Um, and this is important because I think some folks have a sort of conception of where Google is in the marketplace, where it, has, where it is from a services perspective. Um, and I like to make sure that folks know that, you know, maybe, maybe we're not doing the best job of advocating it, but this list is directly informed by our research, the products we run internally, and how they've been brought forward to things as simple as compute that everybody knows, but also things like data flow uh, that is directly based on internal technologies that we've externalized. Okay, so I'd like to get to the practical side. So I sort of give you this, this background on how to think about um, lock-in and where Google is coming from with the research it produces and um, how we look to our technical leadership and our thought leadership. Uh, but now I'd like to move to sort of like the technical side of the talk, which is this is all feedback I've gotten from, uh, from IT executives, from IT leaders uh, as they've moved to Google Cloud. Some of them are not on Google Cloud, but this is the feedback I've gotten. And I bucket it into these five, uh, five general areas that I feel cause friction or customers feel have caused friction um, or that conversely, if they've gotten them right, it's made a much more pleasant journey to go into Google Cloud. So I'd like to go through each one of these things and highlight just a few items. There's deep dive talks on every single one of these areas uh, and the other talks that are, that are going on over the next three days. But if I can highlight a few of the things that I think made a difference, I think that will make uh, uh, your overall experience on coming to Google Cloud better. Okay, so, go back one, please. Uh, so economics. Um, I hear this a lot, is the sort of like, this is unknown. When you buy a server, you sort of know up front like how much it's gonna cost. When you, when you do lock in into some of these scenarios, it's kind of refreshing because you know exactly how much the outlay is and how much the support contract is gonna be. Uh, and then there's, there's all, sorts of cloud, uh, all sorts of cloud studies that say, you know, this cloud is cheaper, that cloud is cheaper. And if I was to put up a big slide that said, um, Google Cloud is cheaper, um, which we've done, uh, I think a, the, the gut reaction is, well, how do you, you, know, how do you gauge that? How do you, how do you assess that? How do I, as an IT leader, assess that? How do I pass that down? It's just some internal assessment that you guys have. Um, so I say, don't, you know, Trust us, I'm a believable guy. But rather, what I think is more useful is to kind of highlight the fact that this is completely transparent. Uh, you can go to three options that I highlight. Uh, one is a pricing calculator. I, I sort of cringe when I hear somebody say, well, you know what, we, we think the costs are gonna run away from us. We think that this is gonna be way more expensive. You're hiding something. Uh, you know, tell, I, I've read this horror story about a customer who had runaway, uh, runaway costs with everything that uh, they put up in the cloud. Um, I don't understand how that's possible uh, because you could plug in every single thing uh, into our calculator. And it's really cool is because you can do it by workload. You can say, like, how many VMs is this expected to take? How much bandwidth is it going to take up? How much storage do I need? And that becomes really handy because, number one, you get to highlight how much the savings are. Uh, but number two, it's savable. So you can share that around uh, as an artifact and send that to finance and managers, et cetera, and get sort of budget approval that way. Uh, but it puts the onus on you to decide uh, if it's a worthwhile venture or how much savings there is. There's all kinds of internal uh, aspects as well. So there's a pricing calculator, there's a pricing page, and there's a TCO calculator. We realize that's a very, very common, uh, a, a common activity is for you to say, like, how do you stack up against uh, XYZ? And so our TCO calculator goes basically and says, here's a particular given workload that's on our platform, and here's what it's currently running on another platform. And so we try to demystify that process as much as you can. There's some interesting aspects to the way we do, uh, to the way we manage our pricing. Number one is that VMs are per minute uh, after a minimum of 10 minutes, and you just charge per minute. So what that does is it gets you very, very close to sort of the grain of how you're consuming a service. Um, there's right-sizing VMs, so you can customize the VM size to the exact sort of amount of memory and CPU that you want to use. 
Um, and we typically see uh, a tremendous amount of savings when folks uh, optimize the heck out of how they're using Google Cloud Foundry. You can see upwards of over 50%. Again, if I put up a slide of 50%, I think that meets with a lot of skepticism. So instead, price it out. Use things like uh, per minute billing. Use things like uh, preemptible VMs that I'll talk about in a second. Preemptive VMs, um, I'm just, I'll, I'll kind of highlight that. Uh, so I talked about per minute and I talked about other things. Preemptive VMs, preemptible VMs. Uh, essentially, this means that you can spin up a VM. We could take it away in, with any time within. You get it for up to 24 hours. Uh, but as long as it keeps running, you're getting that VM on, on upwards of about 80% discount. So if you have things like batch processing, things that run in the background, and that's fixed. You just get an 80% discount for as long as that VM is running. Again, it's still per minute billing. Um, and then what's not shown here is that the, the pricing is always trending downwards. Uh, this, is another, uh, this is another one that I hear from a lot of uh, sort of pricing and pricing discussions. Uh, and we don't believe in soft ROI is usually the way that I hear that back. And it's like, well, did you say that? Or did your finance guy say that? Or did your finance person say that, I should say. Um, and I get it. It's much easier to deal with hard ROI. Like if I purchase A and I purchase B, I just want to know what the delta is. But that, that is, is such a disservice um, because of the fact of uh, how do you account for the fact if your team can essentially work twice as fast or if you can produce software with half the number of, half the number of participants. Um, these things make a big difference. I mean, I kind of liken it to the fact that, you know, why do companies acquire other companies? They acquire other companies usually, you know, because of market reach, et cetera. But a lot of times it's because, well, you know, that, that small startup is like two years ahead of us in this space. So if you buy them, it works out better for us because we, we'll get a jump start into that marketplace by two years. We'll acquire all those engineers. So we make all kinds of decisions in our business to accelerate the pace of business. And on the outright, I think that you could turn around and measure all those things. But when it comes to cloud, for some reason, you know, those, those economics are hard to instill in people. But what I would say is, um, to do yourself justice, look at the soft ROI factor. Um, it's, there's a lot of sort of... Uh, at this point, there's a lot of data and collateral about just how much faster folks can work in a cloud environment with open APIs and open source, et cetera, than they can in a non-cloud environment, uh, or you know, what happens when a developer can work twice as fast with an easier tool set. Um, if you don't measure that, I think it becomes hard to see the cloud value. Uh, you know, if you just start looking at pure economics, the economics are better, uh, but they just look a whole lot better when you make sure to factor in exactly how much better your teams are operating. Um, this is how I, I see uh, things going from a consumption perspective, is that if you think about buying a server and racking and stacking it, you're, you're akin to owning it. Um, if you think about locking into a one-year agreement to use a particular VM for a certain amount of time, or colo or something like that, that's kind of akin to renting it. You're paying a fixed amount for a large block of time. What's happening now? Uh, and then we see this just in, in every single product, uh, is that the grain is becoming as small as it can be. So I talked about our VM pricing. Our, P our VM pricing is per minute. That's, that's close to as, you know, as close to the grain as you can get in terms of consuming that. But you know, per the gigabyte, per the API call, there's a number of companies right now um, who have found a whole new economy in externalizing their APIs. Google has recently uh, acquired a company called Apigee, and that was the entire sort of mode of that company, was sort of helping companies externalize their APIs for some sort of consumption, a lot, and in many cases, around monetary consumption. Um, and so as, as, a, as an IT leader or somebody who's trying to consume services, what this should do is it should sort of make you ask the question as you're consuming a service. Well, are we, are we consuming it, or does it look more like we're renting it, or in fact, does it look, look more like we're buying it because we're gonna be stuck with this thing for three years? In a perfect world, you could consume, which basically means you just pay per the metered use of that service, pretty much on the scale of what the breast pricing is. That's, the best, that's sort of the win-win the arrangement. Um, and so as you're, as you're looking to how you consume or how you uh, acquire IT services, including a cloud environment, for each of the dimensions that you're acquiring, think about, well, is there a consumption-based model for what I'm doing? Uh, so that I don't have to get stuck into something that looks like a, a lock-in or a longer term. Uh, many of the things we do on top of Google Cloud that actually help that consumption model. Um, there's, there's an interesting trend I'll mention, and I'll, I'll highlight it later, but 
When a VM can spin up in, in roughly a minute, that's, that's about the time it takes for our uh, VMs to spin up and recharge per a minute, uh, it makes all kinds of patterns, uh, all kinds of new patterns possible. Um, so if anybody here has been, who's here and managed like a Hadoop cluster or has had to have a Hadoop cluster in their environment? And so you think about managing Hadoop cluster and it's like this monolithic add server, add server, add server, and you're growing this HDFS environment. Um, uh, or you're doing it to increase your, your worker capability or your mapper capability or your, HD, your, your storage capability. But if we have VMs that can spin up in 90 seconds, um, or spin up in 60 seconds, then we've sort of turned that model on its head. We have a great blog post that came out that basically showed how customers were essentially saying, well, I have got this you know, batch of data and I need to run a job on it. I actually spin up a cluster to run against the data, output a report, and then I tear down the cluster. And because I'm paying you know, by the minute, um, that's a pretty easy operation to accommodate. I'll talk about that again in a, in a, in a second. Uh, security. This, by and large, um, it becomes you know, the sticky point because this is where compliance officer starts to get involved and the CISO starts to get involled and you know, IT starts to say, well, can we just, just let it go, just let it go. Um, we don't want you to let anything go. Uh, there's a lot of uh, security framework built into the platform. I think that not hitting this head on in your discussions, uh, hit it head on with, uh, with Google as you engage with Google head on, uh, but it's absolutely something you want to uh, uh, engage on. So right now at Google, there are something like over 600 dedicated security engineers. Like these are folks that actually deal day in, day out with security. Um, we have 100, uh, that research link that I sent in the beginning, that research link, we have something like 160 publications on just security, things that have been adopted um, and, and but by other companies. Companies have been formed by some of the research that we put out. Um, but we've made steps to essentially make sure that you can sort of trust us but verify. The, the medium, the language we use to disseminate how we adhere to, uh, how do we here adhere to a certain security bar is by means of certifications and attestations. And so those are the certifications and attestations we have. Um, but that's not enough. That's sort of the trust but verify. It means that somebody else has come into our environment verified everything we had and made it externally digestible by yourselves. Uh, we also become very prescriptive. And prescriptive in the sense that uh, we've put out a security white paper and we tell you essentially from an application perspective, how do you build an application uh, securely? Uh, these are white papers that are available currently right now. And uh, the important thing to th realize there is it's obviously when, when we talk about a, a secure platform, we both have a we both have skin in the game. Google is making sure that essentially all the attack vectors that fall within the providers, uh, with, within us as a cloud provider spectrum are taken care of, but it doesn't stop you from leaving SSH open to the world and putting your private key in a public bucket. Um, and, and there are, if you don't believe me, that's, you know, just Google that. Uh, you'll see people do things like that. Um, or leaving a bucket wide open and it's your backups. So, you know, with great power comes great stupidity. Um, so. <laughs> but, you know, obviously we want to make sure that you're using the right controls. Uh, but the underlying is there is sort of, uh, you know, what is the inherent security? There's no reason for you to sort of question that or wonder if it exists. We say simply, you know, check out the attestations. We can send you these and check out the white papers. Okay. Um, how do I know Google's not, you know, uh, doing funny things with my data? So by default, uh, Everything is encrypted. Everything is uh, encrypted in motion, and everything is encrypted at rest. This is the uh, encryption at rest. There's a white paper there at the bottom that goes into it in far more detail. But nothing is ever written inside a Google platform that's not encrypted. Uh, we do some unique things, though, uh, on top of that. One is you get to sort of pick where you want to be on this continuum. Uh, if you want it fully managed, means we just encrypt. There's nothing we write of your data that's not encrypted. Um, but we also have another option, which is essentially you can uh, hold the keys of what, how your data is encrypted. Uh, that takes two flavors. That's a flavor where we manage the apparatus, the cloud, you know, essentially the cloud service that holds the keys, but it's your, you dictate you know, what applications and what systems can, can retrieve keys out. That's a, that's a service we have called Cloud KMS. And we do something kind of unique here, which is uh, customer supplied encryption keys. And what this means is this is your own key management system where you can bring your keys into Google's environment and your data will be encrypted with your keys. Um, 
And essentially what that means is when you, 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 the, the key as it's transmitted to us will be used for decryption and encryption operations, but we never store the key in, on disk. It's only used in memory um, and you supply it in operations that you need to use encrypted data on. And that applies currently to our VMs and our cloud storage. The, uh, the thing, the important thing to realize is uh, when you're at the fully managed, there's sort of an uh, efficiency, or I would say there's a trade-off of efficiency. As you move towards the customer supplied keys, there's obviously there's sort of implies like a higher number of operations that are going to be having to take place between the customer and the environment. So if you're at the fully managed side, that's sort of native to the platform, your data is always written encrypted. If you're on the other side of the spectrum, um, then there's a higher number of operations for these decrypt things that take on. But the important thing is you can feel very comfortable uh, that your data is never unencrypted. And if you ever say wanted, like, hey, this is really, really sensitive data, I never want uh, there to be a possibility of looking at it without my involvement. In fact, I don't even want the keys inside of Google. We, ha we give you that flexibility. I think that's something kind of unique to us right now. Um, similarly, uh, there's never a mystery of who did what. I think this is a, sort of like a, a fear or phobia, like who opened my environment, who opened my firewall. Um, who exported my data. All that stuff is available in audit logs. This is pretty standard stuff. Uh, this is available to you to, to, to see on our audit logs. It's available for you to stream out and feed it, feed it into your, uh, to your SIM system, uh, to feed it to Splunk, to feed it any, any number of downstream systems. Um, so we don't make it a mystery as to who's done what on your environment. Uh, this is a fun one. Um, security keys. How many people have used security keys? Right. Cool. Do all you people work for Google? No? Uh, so this is really uh, something I found fun. I, I joined Google and I was told, hey, we don't have VPN. I was like, yes, no more work from home. And they're like, that's not what it means. We, don't, we just don't have VPN within Google. We use uh, different kind of mechanisms we assume. Uh, we don't make any assumptions about open trust and open networks and things like that. We don't have this kind of hard outer candy shell uh, model, we essentially assert identity and encryption and security at every single interaction and every single call. Um, and this is one of them. So it hinges on identity. Identity is, is key. Identity is essentially at a fundamental level uh, how you uh, endorse somebody within your environment uh, to do something inside of the Google Cloud environment. And so we, we basically put identity on a pedestal. It's very important to us for, not, for that not to get screwed up. So Google came up with a standard uh, called UTF. Uh, it's also on that research paper, and we've externalized it now. It's taken up by something called the FIDO Alliance. Um, and so these keys are made by, um, by folks that implement that standard. But this is unfishable. Uh, phishing resistant, I apologize. Phishing resistant. This is your best bet for avoiding network-based vector attacks. So what that means is if you have a laptop right now, and somebody is looking over your shoulder, and they've discovered your username and password, and they take your laptop, and it has this key, you're out of luck. That's bad. Um, but somebody in the middle, this is, this is the more prevalent case, is you're being phished. Somebody sends you a link, an email, it looks legit, you click on it, um, it's very sophisticated nowadays, and you're sort of duped into giving away your username and password, uh, heaven forbid. So uh, when an attacker has that, they're going to turn around and try to use those credentials immediately on whatever source system they, they fooled you into using. And so folks said, OK, you know what? We'll do this one-time password thing, uh, where we'll send a code to your phone or a six-digit rotating code and, or one-time password, and you'll, you know, that'll protect, protect you. If somebody's fooled you into sending your username and password, they're fooling you into sending that too. Um, so the idea is that this, because you are in a position to give away those credentials, you can you know, say, oh, it's 123456. Here, 123456. Thank you very much. I'll turn around and break into your account. Um, this is, this is outside your scope of knowing what's going on. These keys get enrolled in Google. And essentially, for those of you who are familiar with SSH, this is equivalent to what happens with SSH. They're sort of like a two halves of a key pair that no, no human sort of can cryptographically get in the middle of. It. So if, you're, if you get an assertion back from whatever website and your security guy goes, That's not, that doesn't match my signature, um, then you know that basically you're not talking to the source you've enrolled it to. Conversely, um, if somebody tries to break into your account because they have their username and password and they just somehow figure out they're going to spoof this and send something random, the same thing. They're going to be like, that doesn't match the challenge phrase uh, of what was enrolled. So we've found this to be, again, one of the most effective ways. Um, and the other thing is, found that it takes you know, how many seconds to break out the one-time password, log into your phone, extract those keys, and, and send them over. You just touch this. That's all it takes. It takes a human touch 
Because if it didn't require human intervention, then you could essentially write something browser-based that could spoof a touch. So this requires a physical human touch. It's really cool. That's why I spent a little bit of time on it. I think even if, uh, uh, if for nothing else, you know, spend the $10 and get this. Um, let's see. On to networking and operations. Um, Identity, so piggybacking on how critical identity is to get right and making sure nobody breaks the identity and, and nobody sort of falsely claims who they are. Uh, in order to do anything inside a Google Cloud environment, uh, we need to assert your identity. And so we need to know who you are. Uh, this is, and so we have a couple ways to do that. So a, a big tip here that I've heard from a lot of customers and we've made this pretty easy, uh, is use something called uh, our directory sync, which can take your directory and replicate that into your uh, G Suite instance. And so that way we know about users and groups and attributes. Passwords don't get synced. Passwords you still have to sort of create at a Google level. Um, but this way, you know, somebody leaves your environment, directory sync will trigger and remove them. You add somebody to a group, um, those groups can be used. We can do SSO back to your, you know, we essentially SAML federate back to some other authentication system, whether you're using a third party hosted version or um, on-prem, uh, so you can say, okay, when somebody needs to authenticate, I want that to come all the way back home. I don't want that to be inside of Google. Um, or either way. Uh, we also give you something is that once you have uh, authenticated, uh, within the browser experience, when you log into Google Cloud, we give you something called Google uh, Cloud Shell. And so uh, it's essentially a browser-based SSH experience that once you've established your identity and you assert that I'm so-and-so and you've done your you know, if you have it, your security key, um, you don't have to rely on something as static as opening a port and opening an IP address. You can essentially say, now that we know who you are, we'll give you uh, a console that will help you drive your interactions with the cloud environment, uh, rather than having to set up all your tools uh, on-prem and, and, and figure that out. So it's called cl Cloud Shell. I would check that out. Um, this is how we organize uh, your cloud environment at the top level, or something called an organization node. So within, uh, say, a lot of uh, alternate providers, it's, it's very easy to lose track of what accounts I have. That's a big concern that I've heard from a number of customers is like, hey, I don't want to have cloud sprawl. I don't want like, every group to have their own account, and they're spinning up like, how many of our resources, and their billing is getting out of control, and I'm going to lose control as an IT advocate. Everything eventually falls on me. Um, so an organization node allows you to sort of like, have that top level visibility of all the projects that are uh, below that organization. So you never have to feel like, hey, I don't know what's going on inside of my environment, who's doing what, what, what who has access to what. Um, and this applies to policies, too. So you can um, apply a policy at the organization node and have it trickle down. Uh, and it, it'll trickle down, essentially, to, to projects. So I'll talk about projects are essentially containers for everything uh, that, uh, that represents anything under that project. And so you can think of, like, hey, we want uh, you could do it by dev test QA, in integrity, production, et cetera. Um, or you could do it by application. You know, CRM is in this project or so on and so forth. And a lot of times it's kind of a mix and match. You have projects by, um, projects by purpose and projects by function. Um, but uh, you can do some other things with projects as well. You can install SSH keys centrally. So if you're like, hey, this project is going to be for this development effort and these developers need access to it, um, you can put in everybody's SSH key into that public key into that project and it will be propagated through into the environment for anybody to use those VMs. Um, you invite people to projects, which is kind of cool. So you don't have to sort of statically provision them. You can literally say, I want to invite this person by their email address. Uh, they're associated with a billing account, so uh, so you could have multiple accounts, multiple multiple projects associated with a billing account. And so I get kind of asked, like, how do, how would you recommend uh, straightening out projects? And I say, you know, do both. Um, have projects that are based on environment and function, like again, CRM, our customer service, dev test, prod QA, uh, etc. But give developers a project. Projects don't cost anything. Um, and so you can have a bunch of projects all associated with the same billing account. Nothing ramps up uh, sort of cloud know-how. If you think back to my first, you know, one of the first slides was CIO saying, now how do I accelerate this? What are the skills that I need for this? Give, give everybody a sandbox. Um, you can set billing alarms so you know when somebody's getting crazy. Uh, but give them a sandbox. Give them a target for in, ter in terms of how quickly you want something turned over. Uh, There's something, you know, a while ago that sort of started to go out of fashion, which was like internal hackathons. And you know, challenging your developers and your IT uh, folks to, to deliver something within a certain time, time boxed activity. 
So what I found accelerates the best is when you give every developer their own project. Um, at the end of the day, if they don't use it, it's just sitting there. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, but uh, that's, that's sort of what I've seen help accelerate uh, cloud usage. Um, and the developer, the developer projects keep those isolated, right? So folks are like, oh, I don't know what they're going to do. They're going to mess around. You know, there's more risk to some developer kind of going rogue within the environment and accidentally running like a DHCP server or some nefarious server without knowing it inside your environment. That has huge blast radius impact. When you create a project from a Google Cloud perspective, you give every developer their own project. Well, if they go haywire and do something kind of crazy, it's not connected back to your home environment. So it's, it's a nice kind of safe way uh, to, uh, to instill or to instigate kind of uh, moving forward. Uh, networking. So moving down the list, this is one where if you don't get it right, it can be so painful because you know people have deployed VMs and they've deployed applications, and then you take it to networking, and networking is like, thank you for using 10.1.1.1. That's what our company uses. You can't use this, and you have this conflict. And how do you um, how do you deal with it? Um, so a couple ways to deal with it. One, involve networking early, uh, but two, start with automation. Uh, try not as much as possible to craft things by hand. Uh, automate uh, using whatever popular tool suite you have, but automate this from the beginning. Um, so I only mention networking on its own uh, because this is where I see a lot of folks, when, you know, when it starts to go production and they get the network folks involved and they want to talk about firewalls, uh, the first reaction is like, oh, you've totally clobbered our internal IP space. You can't launch with this. Um, so some things here to realize is that uh, if you notice, we have different regions, et cetera. I think that's pretty familiar. We have different zones. Um, but if you notice uh, the, the, the subnets, they go uh, between regions, or you go between this whole network, and you notice that you have subnets in one region and subnets in another region, and it looks like sort of there's a backbone connecting them. That's because there is. So you can have uh, a subnetwork that spans zones, and you can have a subnetwork that lives in a totally different region. And it's like as if you, as a company, created you know, a data center in one geography and a data center in another geography or a different continent. Um, and you're like, hey, if we were to create our own data centers, we'd put like, you know, some sort of VPN or MPLS, et cetera. And we'd expect native connectivity between VMs in one and VMs in the other. That's given to you natively. That's on Google's, Google's backbone, Google's network. You have private addressing with no VPN end to end between all your different regions. Um, and uh, in, the same, uh, in the same project, in the same uh, network. And that's probably different than we're used to. And so what is that global backbone? What is that global scope? I mean, this is sort of a current picture of current and committed regions, uh, points of presence, et cetera. But um, that's kind of a nice feature, is you're taking our fiber under the ocean when you, let's say you had an Asia uh, deployment um, and uh, European deployment and the US deployment. Um, all that's writing across private, uh, private networking. Uh, sort of moving again onto the DevOps side of the house, I just talked a minute ago about automation. Um, yes, containers are a thing. Um, what do they solve? They solve, they solve packaging. Right? Containers solve packaging. They solve basically the ability to bundle things up in a consistent way that's consistently executable in a different environment, no matter how, uh, how they're deployed onto a host. So check positive for awesome, awesomeness. Google, contribute, Google has, from a Linux kernel perspective, Google's contributed a number of things to Linux kernel that's made containers possible. Um, but, but from Google's own lessons in terms of how do they run packages and, and internally uh, on something we call Borg, uh, containers is just one side of the story. How you orchestrate and deploy containers is a whole different ballgame. Like, how do you schedule jobs, and how do you ensure that jobs have continuity when they've been interrupted, et cetera? Um, that's, that's where things get interesting. So there's a number of talks today about Kubernetes, um, or t over the next three days about Kubernetes and, and Google Container Engine that I encourage you to talk to, uh, or, t or I'm sorry, go, go attend um, there and talk to the, uh, the presenters there. But uh, all of Google's sort of experience, what they've learned out of Borg, has been put into Kubernetes. And it's, a, it's an open source project in the wild. So, one thing I'd mentioned there is sort of, I talked a second ago about the networking. And it's like, hey, you know, the best way to ensure that you don't shoot yourself in the foot when it comes to networking uh, is to automate from the start. And if you had to choose between automating or new hotness, which is what containers are, um, choose automation. You'll get a lot more sort of uh, 
uh, bang for your buck about how to automate different processes more so than containers. Once you've figured out automation, absolutely, go for containers, go for Kubernetes, um, but don't go the other way around. Try as much as you can not to build things by hand um, or deploy things by hand. Um, the other thing about uh, containers that's interesting is that you may find yourself challenging conventional ways to do things. Like if you think about conventional host deployments, you deploy something, um, and in a, in a traditional environment, uh, you may, hey, let's, let's prime down antivirus and uh, you know, all these sort of like bolt-on tools that you do because of the mentality of this being sort of like an everlasting infrastructure that could get compromised at any time. Container sort of changes that model, puts it on its head, where you would say, okay, well, I need to, I need to do things like vulnerability scanning and, uh, and security measurement uh, as part of my build process because I'm creating immutable images. And so it doesn't really, uh, there are new techniques in terms of like probes and, and, uh, and things like that to discover when your environment's going haywire. But challenge, challenge the traditional way that you may be dealing with enterprise environments where you, you, know, you lay down antivirus and you lay down all sorts of tools. Uh, instead, you can say like, you know, we've made sure that this, this immutable artifact, this container is secure by part of our build process. And so the output is secure. Now, if something happens, you simply spin out a new, a new container. Uh, don't, in, over, don't over engineer uh, the platform. Uh, this, an example of this is um, our disks are already heavily replicated and HA behind the scenes. Uh, so you don't need to create a VM and then create you know, two disks and say, oh, I've got to raid these two together uh, and then invent one when fails. We're already taking care of all that replication for you behind the scenes. Uh, similarly, if you're using Google Cloud Storage or object storage, we're already making a number of copies of that. So you don't have to say, well, let me put one copy here and let me create another bucket called backup copy. That's already handled for you behind the scenes. Um, similarly, we have a product called Stackdriver, which facilitates logging. So if you're going to have an entire logging infrastructure, uh, realize there's actually a very simple to use API that's part and parcel to every part of your every project that you can simply just say, send my logging to Stackdriver, and you get that. Um, and there's a bunch of other things. There's built-in load balance. There's load balancers. There's uh, tracing. You can actually do code tracing, um, instance mitigation. There's things that we uh, provide in terms of what we call live migration. So if you're inside of a zone and a VM needs to be taken down for maintenance, um, we live migrate that VM to another, uh, another VM so that you don't suffer the, the consequence of us having to do maintenance. Uh, similarly, if you're running, uh, if you have data that's stored on AWS on S3 and you're like, hey, I'd like to use Google as a backup or I'd like to use some of the data analytics tool on Google, um, we have a transfer service. You don't have to write your own transfer service or run a MapReduce job. You can literally go inside of our object stores and say, transfer service, and then move that data over. And I have a lot of customers that are doing that on a, on like a regular basis because they use Google for data processing. Um, this is a huge, huge uh, advantage that a number of customers have mentioned. Uh, this has really changed the way they approach solving data science problems. Uh, going back to the Hadoop discussion earlier, uh, you tend to have a Hadoop cluster, and, and what I've heard from a number of customers, specifically in ad tech, is that Hadoop cluster starts to get really, really bogged down with recurring jobs. Essentially, you have to figure out how to batch jobs together. It doesn't really encourage a lot of data exploration. Um, you're kind of stuck where a lot of data scientists and data professionals are spending more time managing their, their cluster than they are doing data science. BigQuery is like renting thousands of cores for seconds. You submit a job distributes that job to thousands of cores, and you get answers back usually in seconds to minutes. And we've heard stories of folks going from literally like, hey, we used to run this 19-hour report, and now we're down to like 20 minutes. Um, and so if you're, if you're going to take anything else away, figure out how you can leverage BigQuery. And when you're BigQuery, everything looks like a BigQuery problem, um, including ETL, including other things. Um, for those, for those uh, processes that don't lend themselves to go into BigQuery yet, um, we have other things like a publish sub system for uh, events and whatnot. But if you're really stuck and it's like, no, no, I've got processes that are built around Hadoop, then go back to sort of the model I talked about earlier. We have cloud data proc. So you can get a full Hadoop cluster in 90 seconds. And so you can schedule Hadoop jobs, MapReduce jobs, against your data as individual pieces of work, uh, where you could have that data sitting inside of GCS. And then when it's time to process, you kick off a cluster via some API call, process it, and then pull it back. Um, 
the way that I hear the BigQuery story told is uh, one customer sort of describes it as democratizing data access. Because all of a sudden now all his data scientists, or all their data scientists, uh, were able to get at data and start running ad hoc queries. And he's like, you know, that unlocked so much more value for us. And they're, they're an ad tech company. And so being able to start figuring out better segmentation and running queries that just never were possible before made a big change to their business. And ML. OK. So I'll kind of finish with this. Um, is that you heard a lot about how Google treats data. And that's because data is sort of like this, this constant virtuous uh, cycle where we see, you know, the, as customers can get more and more in their data, and we've seen this sort of time and time again with folks using BigQuery and our ML products, is that they spend a lot of time taking care of their data because now they can put it in GCS and they can store it forever and they can put it in BigQuery and they can start running queries and they never did. Uh, all of a sudden, they're able to start deriving new business patterns. Um, and that gives them insights, and that turns around and plugs right back into innovation. It's sort of thinking of new products they can do because they've got access and insights from data they never had before. And once they've done that, all of a sudden, they're, they're able to craft new software. New software leads to more data. And so it's this constant cycle of a faster iteration cycle and richer and better software. Um, and there's a bunch of talks on ML, so I would suggest uh, attending one of those to figure out kind of what the tweak is that ML is putting on the data spin. And with that, thank you.